Okay. I think maybe we'll go to some questions. Uh, Melanie, have we come to that moment? <laughs> So I'm supposed to, these are questions from the audience, I'm supposed to read them? Yeah, just a few of them. Okay. <laughs> All right. Here we go. All right. So I just read the, was this in the script? I didn't know that. All right. All right. Question number one um, concerns um, cybersecurity. And the question is, we know that foreign governments are targeting U.S. commercial and government computer cent, uh, networks. What type of threat does this pose to our country? Are we also at risk of large-scale uh, large cyber attacks from rogue computer hackers or international or organized uh, crime groups? What can private citizens do to recognize and protect against this, uh, this threat? And this is from Mark Dickinson, Community Emergency Response Team. Can you hear that? Um, Ken, I think you're a perfect person. Okay. Um, Take what I just said about how how far we've come with counterterrorism, how quickly that change started, literally uh, by the evening of 9/11. Um, take that as a comparison to where where we've come with in terms of our cyber defenses. It hasn't been the same complete success story. Uh, we were a little slow out of the box with cyber for a variety of reasons, partly because of 9/11. 9/11 sort of required. Uh, a more kinetic, more traditional response, and we didn't focus on cyber. Uh, so I think we're a few years behind. It's just been a little slow. Um, but it's quite clear the implications of the cyber threat. In fact, I think Director Mueller at the same uh, hearing where um, the DNI testified said that, that he sees the cyber threat as becoming the number one threat over terrorism uh, to the United States national security in the near future. And it's, it's understandable why. I mean, everything we do uh, as a government, and I'm going to put aside private industry, but as a government relies on, on cyber. And we have some very determined, very effective adversaries out there. Uh, and there are countries like China, which um, have mounted huge efforts to go after every secret or anything even short of a secret in our government databases and our government systems, and also targeting our industries, our critical infrastructure industries, and trying to soak up as much in terms of trade secrets or any know-how that they can use to get a competitive edge over us in the economy. And uh, that, the, that approach that they're taking requires a really robust approach on our, on our side to respond to it. And I know this president has, been, has carried on that effort from President Bush. Uh, to get a cybersecurity strategy in place, and it's a very complicated undertaking. Maybe Admiral might want to address this, but it's, it's very difficult because it draws on our military, NSA, it draws on DHS, it draws on law enforcement, um, and it's carried out in cyberspace, which is just an untraditional, difficult environment to actually sort of wage that kind of effort. Um, so I think that that is where we need to keep our eye on the ball for the near future. Uh, Chris, when I speak to people about cyber, uh, I tend um, to compare it to the physical world. And, and uh, heretofore, in the physical world, we, we treated policy as you know, having bright lines, sharp borders. And when you start to get into the cyber domain, you find those borders fading away. Uh, the border between near and far has, has disappeared completely. Uh, at the speed of light, uh, attacks can, can occur at the speed of light. Uh, the, the border between peace and war. Has, has almost uh, disappeared. When somebody is snorkeling around on your computer network, you don't know if they're just doing espionage and exfiltrating uh, industrial secrets or whether they're leaving little presents behind or whether they're actually conducting an attack. The border between civil and military is tough to, uh, to, to see right now. Uh, for example, many of our, our military communications networks ride on civilian systems. So if the civilian systems aren't well protected, we could end up losing in the, in the long run. Uh, and, and so, uh, and I could go on about the fading borders piece, but the key is for us to try to find policy tools that work in a land of fading borders that still protect our civil liberties and the things that we cherish as a nation. Uh, and that is, I think, a principal policy challenge ahead of us to make sure we get after that work as expeditiously as we can, because the Secretary Panetta has pointed out, you know, this is our next Pearl Harbor if we're not careful. We have another technology question. Maybe I'll ask the senator to pick up this on this and any other comments you want to make on cyber uh, security. This question is, we have seen technologies provide new capabilities to leaderless collectives, such as terrorism networks, flash mobs, and citizen movements. 
for example, the Arab Spring, uh, the Occupy protests. So A, how, much, um, how must our government change to address the emerging threats posed by the rise of more decentralized and adaptive collective action? And B, is fusion of information from social media and other social networking tools providing adequate actionable intelligence? So this uh, multi-dimensional question was posed by a member of my university, uh, Dr. Uh, Jameson Day at the uh, College of Business at the University of Denver. I think it was um, Shimon Perez who said in that deep voice of his uh, that when I grew up, uh, I consulted the book. Now the younger generation consults the Facebook. Um, and he was speaking positively of the developments uh, in Egypt. It really is these devices that we all carry now that have helped fuel these movements. Technology at its best liberates us and creates more freedom, which is right in our wheelhouse. So on balance, I think the technology is very good news for what we believe in, what are our core principles. Uh, another example of where this is benefiting us is in the so-called open source intelligence. OSINT is the, I can use an acronym. Uh, I'm sure I really have been studying. Uh, OSINT, open source information, there's an amazing amount of data out there that then through the use of computer programs and more, uh, even more effectively, these smart young people that work in the intelligence world uh, generate actionable intelligence on societies that have heretofore been closed or organizations that have been hard to penetrate. Uh, we should be rooting for the North Koreans, I think, Chris, you would agree, to get more and more cell phones. Uh, the Iranians, other oppressive uh, country, uh, countries where the people are oppressed, uh, this, is, this is to be uh, reveled in. The one area where it is a real concern we just talked about, which is, which is cyber. Uh, and there, I've come convinced of the last couple years, this is, this is a true set of threats. It presents a whole other set of questions. The Admiral alluded to one, when do you determine and how do you determine whether you've been attacked in a cyber setting by an enemy or was it a fluke, or was it a hack, or was it a teenager somewhere? And how do you respond? Do you respond kinetically? If somebody takes out your radar system uh, and blinds you, do you then put jets in the air to take out whoever blinded your radars, uh, take out their technology? How, how do you know? Or could a third party, by teasing out this situation, get two powers two nation states into a conflict that neither one wanted, and in fact, neither one of them triggered. So there, there are a, a host of really uh, important questions to be, uh, to be answered. We need to take up in the Congress uh, legislation to create an architecture to provide more direction, particularly into uh, civil society, to the .gov and .com areas. The military in the .mil world is really uh, hardening their, their systems, but I think the Admiral uh, would tell you there are, over, there are tens of thousands of attempts every day to penetrate the Department of Defense's computers, tens of thousands uh, every day. I, I don't want to dwell on this, but this is a really important area, and uh, the, the Congress needs to particularly provide direction to the private sector that doesn't uh, constrict the private sector's freedom, private sector's entrepreneurship. 85% of our infrastructure that's tied to cyber is in the, in the private sector. So stay tuned for that the debate to begin in the next uh, few weeks. And there are a lot of competing points of view. You may have followed the PIPA and SOPA debate recently. Uh, there, there are some uh, analogies to what we're now going to have to debate over how we manage cyber and cyber threats to the PIPA-SOPA uh, debate we just recently had. We have a lot of really good questions here, but apparently time for only one. I mean, there are some good questions on the question of domestic radicalization and uh, you know, how is that, could that uh, turn into a terrorism threat. We have questions about information sharing between citizens and government, but also a question on, on energy. And, and uh, I must say, since coming to uh, live in Den Denver, Colorado, you're looking at the biggest supporter of shale uh, oil that you've ever seen, because I think it's high time we develop these domestic sources. So let me ask this question. Uh, this is from Jessica Jacobs. 
uh, ed energy, are there policies we should be implementing to increase our energy security and our national security while also transferring uh, fewer resources to such undemocratic regimes as those in Iran and Venezuela, and the list can go on. So uh, why don't we start with the Admiral here? Well, I think it's, it's uh, self-evident, it goes without saying, that if we were less dependent on foreign sources of energy, that we would um, have a lot less, uh, a lot fewer concerns out there in the world. Uh, and so it is an imperative. Uh, uh, when you look at the, uh, the troubles that we've lived with over many decades in the, in the Gulf, uh, our, it seems, you know, there are precious few countries in this world who are energy producers, who uh, don't have Dutch syndrome where, where there's instability and, and trouble. You know, the Norwegians, or you know, my wife is of Norwegian descent, lovely. Uh, she's out there. Uh, the Norwegians are, they're not one of those countries, right? But many of them uh, have been very troublesome from Venezuela to the Gulf countries. Nigeria's having its issues right now. So the, the less we have to depend on that sort of thing, the less... Uh, Less we have to do in my business. Ken, can I get a comment from you on energy security? Yeah, I'm not looking forward to five dollar gallon of gas. Come to Colorado; it's much cheaper okay. here. Okay. All right. Yeah, the, the admiral put it uh, well in a compelling fashion. I don't think we'll ever be, uh, although politicians use this term, energy independent. But we can certainly be a lot more energy self-reliant, and we can work with nations that are a part of the civilized. Uh, 21st century uh, regime who also want to be freed from dependence on all these countries that have abundant oil but that don't share our values. It, it is more than ironic. I think uh, God's giving us a real challenge here. Uh, but there's a, there's a way forward, and it's an all of the above strategy. Uh, and I can brag a little bit on the Senate of the United States and tell you in the last Congress we had a comprehensive all of the above strategy that came out of the Energy Committee, bipartisan support. Uh, and it included everything from a green energy bank to a, a piece of legislation I've authored which would do research and development on small modular nuclear reactors like the Navy uses, uh, to enhancing the production of uh, uh, shale gas, to uh, encouraging R&D into carbon capture and sequestration on the coal side. Every technology has upsides, every technology uh, has downsides. I'm a huge renewable energy advocate. Many of you know that. I led the charge with my good friend Lola Spradley, the former Republican Speaker of the State House, to pass Amendment 37. So we had a, a goal for renewable energy in our electricity sector. We've blown by that first goal. We're going for 30 percent. We have the second highest goal in the country. We're going to reach it here in Colorado. It's driving job creation, of course, environmental benefits, and it has enormous national security uh, 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 ramifications. So this is a passion of mine. Uh, we got to keep at it. We need a comprehensive policy, all of the above. Uh, we can't. We we got to find a way that we don't favor any one technology, but let them all compete. And boy, just think of the flexibility, Admiral, we'd have in our geopolitical posture and our leadership of the world. Uh, so let's 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 get that done. I mean, I we could get that done, and voters of Colorado said they'd had enough of me in 2014. I'd 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 be happy as could be. If we get Simpson Bowles done too, by the way, we've got to get we've got to get our debt on a sustainable trajectory. If we got those two things done, all my Republican friends here, help me get that done and I'll retire. And uh, <laughs> we, we let, a couple, let somebody else have a run. All right, we'll, we'll make sure we, we air the full sound bite on that so that doesn't <laughs> get pulled out of. Uh, if, I, if I have everybody just go ahead and if I get everybody to hang tight for just a second, uh, we're going to retire the colors in just a moment, so please don't go anywhere. Um, but first, how about a round of applause for all our panelists here. Um, thank you all for sharing your insights. And, and thank all of you for taking such an interest and, and making sure that you have as much information as you can about the issues. That's always something I can respect. And please stay tuned um, to thecell.org for future events like this one and also information about the opening of their newly redesigned exhibit. And now if you could all please rise for just a second and we'll have the honor guard come retire the colors.
Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. Drive home safely. It is very windy outside. I don't know how many of you were able to hear the wind howling. There are trees down.